welcome once again to uh, our Come Follow Me. Don't ever forget, if you haven't yet, click the subscribe and like us, please. Give us a subscription so that we can help do this for you. I love that. You have to like it before you hear it. That's positive. Yeah, isn't that good? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to do the Exodus Passover. Oh. I'm Rhonda Pickering. I'm Farrell. We're doing Exodus 7 through 12. Episode 14. We're about to learn more about Passover and what's going on in the Exodus than you ever thought was on that page. Hopefully not more than you want to know. We're glad you're with us today. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Hopefully you'll you'll learn more about the Exodus and Passover than you ever have on a surface reading before. And just to start it off, we're going to start with a chart that helps us understand that what's going on in the Exodus is a type and a shadow, not only for prophecies that will be be fulfilled by Jesus Christ, but we are looking at an end time picture of what is going to happen in the grand finale that we are going to be a part of. And the how God orchestrates history and types from the past to predict so the future is basically what our angle and our approach to studying the Old Testament with you is this year. So the first thing that we have to set up right out of the gate is that this slavery, this bondage of Israel and Egypt is a type of our own bondage to sin and our entrapment and captivity by Satan. That's a great angle. In the time of Christ with regards to his atonement. But in the end time, we have to realize, and I've said this many, many times, we are in captivity when the Deliverer comes. We are in captivity when Zion is redeemed. I was going to say it's fascinating to also realize when you talk about types and shadows, um, the Red Sea is almost a baptism. Absolutely. And a a rebirth, a a redemption of Zion. Represented our baptism. And we're going to see that there's there's some pretty amazing parallels between the crossing of the Red Sea, the fall of Egypt, and the fall of Jericho, which happened on the same day historically a few years apart, but also with the fall of Babylon in the end time because the tares are choking the wheat in the last days. At the time of the wheat harvest, at the end of the time of the Gentiles, this latter day grand finale that Daniel's numbers tell us so much about. But today we're going to see how also the story of the exodus the story of the redemption of israel is going to be not only a picture of the atonement of jesus christ but the deliverance and the redemption of zion in the last days because all of these events will replay egypt in exodus and the torah is called a fiery an iron furnace And that furnace shows us a lot of imagery about the fact that the Passover lamb was supposed to be roasted with fire. They couldn't boil it. They had to, they were instructed that they had to create these types and these rehearsals that had to be done just exactly so because every detail was a picture of something future, just like the ordinances in the temple are today. Just like your baptism is a picture of a rebirth. Not only the rebirth that you have at the time of your baptism, but the rebirth that you will have when you die and are resurrected into the arms of Jesus Christ as part of his kingdom. So the bondage in Egypt is, of course, going to be sin and death and also in the end time captivity by the harlot Babylon. And your Pharaoh, and this is interesting because, you know, just like in Isaiah, you often have a type that's good on the one side and bad on the other. And it's the same word, like a hand. You can, you have, a, you can have a right hand of God, and then you can have a left hand. And it's kind of like the Hebrew. Yeah, it's got that, yeah. that reversal kind of effect right. that, that transfers over into the language. So our Pharaoh, 
who was a righteous king in Joseph's dreams, is now going to be the king that's fighting against Israel. He's going to be the adversary. Of course, Satan, the ruler of this world, is going to be that person in speaking of the atonement of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, in the latter days, he's going to be an antichrist. He's going to be, in Isaiah, he's going to be the king of Assyria, or the arch tyrant that becomes ruler of the world. Fascinating symbols with the burning bush. We have, um, in the Hebrew... The word for, that's translated there as bush comes from something, the root word comes from something that pricks. And so you, this is a thorn bush of the desert. It's an acacia bush, and it's, um, it, it is being consumed by fire. And so what would fire be in, in imagery? I guess you'd more say consumed. In, I'm not consumed, but... It, it, it's it's encompassed yeah, in it, fire, it, it, not it's consumed. Being, it's on fire, but it's not consumed. Yeah, actually, I was going to say right? you got to yeah, clear that good up. Correction there. Okay, and so you got the fire. What what would the fire be? You have a thorn bush. The uh, redeemer, the atonement. The, so the fire is going to be yeah. It's going to be a judgment in 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 scripture throughout scripture. Even when you have the fire of the Shekinah glory, it's a it's, judgment. Okay, so if you have a thorn bush. What do thorns symbolize in Scripture? Thorns, briars and thorns in Isaiah are wicked people. Um, but go back to the law of first mention. When were the thorns first mentioned? That was when Adam was receiving the curse in the garden. So the thorns came up as part of a, a covenant curse. Your thorns represent sin and wickedness. And so here Moses is seeing a bush that is being aflame with judgment and fire, but not consumed. So that's a picture of both the judgment and the mercy of God, that the representation of sin is being enveloped by the light and the fire of God, but we are not consumed because there has been atonement provided that we can survive that transfiguration. All right, they have, we're going to see um, the 10 plagues of Egypt. We're going to take a lot of a closer look at those. And we're going to see that in Jesus' time, he heals leprosy, which is a picture of death and the diseases. And then also in the last days, we're going to find that there are plagues being poured out in the book of Revelation. All right, there, um, one of the, the very important things to realize is, and this is kind of an overview, we'll look at a lot of these a little bit closer. In Exodus 4, God says, Israel is my firstborn. So have you ever noticed that since Jacob's name got changed to Israel, well, when Abraham's name got changed to Abraham, do we often call him Abraham still? Or do we have a hard time calling him Abraham because we're so used to calling him Abraham? We usually kind of default to the new name, right? Exactly. When someone's name gets changed in Scripture. but what you're Maybe gonna, not in the case of Israel. But what you're going to find Jacob is interesting is, is, is with Jacob Israel, more often the Scriptures are going to call him Jacob, even though his name has been changed to Israel, and only occasionally is the Lord going to use the name Israel. I want you to become sensitive to that because they really have two different nuances. Jacob is always going to be the one that's in trouble and is not quite converted, but he, he's, he's, God's trying to get him to convert. Jacob is going to be the one that is the word that he's going to use when Jacob is in trouble. So we don't, we don't say it's the time of Israel's trouble. What do we say? Jacob's trouble. It's the time of Jacob's trouble in Scripture. But when God uses the term Israel, it's usually more reflective of, of a people that have become in covenant with him, that are God's people, okay? And yes, they're interchangeable. Yes, Jacob and Israel are the same person, but they're kind of two different stages of the same of person, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, and that and that nuance, it, the Lord's going to be the, the Holy Spirit that fingerprints throughout the scriptures all of those beautiful things of God is going to be very careful in the use of Jacob or Israel and when he's using them, okay? It's important that God says in Exodus chapter 4 that Israel is his firstborn. 
He's going to identify Israel as his firstborn. And then, of course, in the end time, we know that the mission of the 144,000 is to bring people to the what? To the church of the firstborn. Okay, so this firstborn image and, and the believers in, in Christ become his saints. They become his people. And the reason this is so important is because the Passover lamb had to be firstborn. So Jesus Christ, as a representative of the Passover lamb, of, of God's firstborn people, he is going, the firstborn of God is going to be willing to lay his life down to redeem the firstborn of Israel. And that's exactly what we're going to see here in Exodus in the imagery of the Passover lamb being slain and the firstborn being passed over. All right, and so then, of course, none of that can happen without the blood of the lamb. And the blood of the lamb is symbolic of the suffering of Jesus Christ at both Gethsemane and Calvary. And we'll take a closer look at that in a moment as well. But in the Day of Atonement, which is our imagery for the second coming of Christ at the Mount of Olives, we, when Israel is forgiven and cleansed of her sins and Jesus comes and reigns as King of Kings and saves her in, in a grand Red Sea type event as well there, when a grand reversal when, when it looks like there's no way they could possibly survive the attack of all the nations that have surrounded her. God will put his foot on that mount. He will place his hand a second time and Israel will be saved. Now, moving on to the unleavened bread item here, we have this whole casting out of the leaven that is going to be representative of in Exodus, that they, they didn't have time to let their bread base, and they're commanded that they are to eat unleavened bread in the time of, of the week of Passover to this day in commemoration of the fact that they had to leave in a hurry and that the bread didn't have time to rise and that unleavened bread is a symbol of the casting out of sin. Leaven is considered a something that causes things to corrupt faster and, and to, um, I want to say mold or mildew or, or whatever. It causes your bread to spoil faster. And so this is a symbol of sin in our lives. And then, of course, hasting away, be, they had to, you have to eat the Passover meal with your shoes on because you have to be ready to go. And it is a hasting away out of Egypt. And that is a symbol of, of fleeing from sin, getting out of Babylon, not touching anything unclean like the leaven. All, you see all of this imagery in scripture in the last days as well. Whereas Jesus himself will be the only one in his atonement that will be able to cast out sin. And it's important when we realize the deliverance in the end time. We had in the day of Moses, Moses was the deliverer, but was he really? Who is the deliverer? The deliverer is Christ. Moses could not act without the blood of the lamb. It was through the blood of the lamb that Israel was saved. And it's the same in the end time. In the end time, there, when all of this replays again, there is going to be another deliverer. But this deliverer, just as it's pictured on the Day of Atonement, couldn't, he, he's the scapegoat in the Day of Atonement, but he couldn't do his job if the goat that was yod he vav he that goat that represented Christ, if Christ wasn't standing by his side, he couldn't do. And that's why on the screen you, you see that Jesus is the deliverer at the Atonement with a capital D. Moses is a deliverer with a little d. And in the end time, the end time deliverer um, that the scriptures so often call David will be a deliverer with a, a small d. Standing next to Christ, he will be able to help all of the prophecies about Israel come to fulfillment. So in Exodus 4, that verse where it says, Israel is my son, 
notice that the Lord says to Moses, this is clear back in the burning bush, okay? He hasn't gone back to Egypt. Aaron hasn't even come to start to talk to him yet. He has no idea how any of this is going to go down other than somehow this flame is going to consume sin without destroying it, without destroying the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh. So he's talking about he was able to throw the staff down and then it would become a snake. But the thing that made it different than what the magicians are going to do is that he would be able to pick that snake up and be in control of that snake. He has power over him. And then the other one was a sign of death again. He put his hand into his bosom and then he pulled it out and it would, it would be leprous. And then he would put it back in and then it would be healed of that leprosy. So the Lord is showing Pharaoh some signs that Pharaoh's going to get that this God is claiming to have control over the adversary and to have power over death. And then the third sign that Moses was to show Pharaoh was to turn the water to blood. So then he's going to say to Pharaoh, And I say unto thee, Let my son go, Israel, that he may serve me, and that if thou refuse to let him go, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Now the reason I put this up here is because I want you to see that God knew exactly how this was all going to go down before Moses even was called to go back into Egypt. And I just want you to wrap your head around the fact that Heavenly Father knows exactly how this end time scenario in our day is going to go down. He's planned it. And we're told that even Pharaoh hardens his heart so that others will be able to see that he is a powerful God. All right, and then back up to that furnace, I wanted to show you that, that what we're showing you is not just isolated to Isaiah. It's not just isolated to prophecies fulfilled by Christ or even to the exodus out of Egypt. These same types of images for the last days are found throughout Scripture. So the fiery furnace, of course, when we think of that furnace, we think of Daniel and his friends in um in the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, chapters 2 through 7 are in a different language than chapters 1 and 8 through 12. And this is a literary device that was used by Daniel because chapters 1 and 8 through 12 are written in Hebrew. And that means it is written as prophetic for Israel. But chapters 2 through 7, he recorded in Aramaic. And that helps you know that these chapters are about the Gentiles. Well, it's kind in of the two, three, time. six, and seven. So, in the Aramaic chapters two through seven, they are also chiastic in theme. And so, if you look at chapter two, you're going to have those Gentile kingdoms in the statue that you saw with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. And then in chapter seven, you're going to see those same four kingdoms represented mm. in four beasts. And so this is kind of creating a, a Gentile chiastic umbrella between chapters 2 and 7, the first and last of the Aramaic chapters. Then chapters 3 and 6 will be in a chiastic parallel. And notice that chapter 3 is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and I can't do their Hebrew names <laughs> off the top of my head, but they are saved in the fiery furnace, whereas in chapter 6, Daniel is saved in the lion's den. Mm -hmm. So you have the saving of them in chapters 3 and 6. Then in the center, in chapters 4 and 5, you have the two chapters where Babylon will fall. You have the tree imagery that gets cut down in chapter 4, and then you have the old writing of the wall, writing with the finger on the wall, that your time has been numbered and you've been judged and you've been found wanting. So here we see in the very center of the Gentile chapters, chapters 2 through 7, that Babylon falls, but the friends of Daniel and Daniel are saved through that fall. And I just love this. I I mm. love finding literary structures in the in the scriptures. So let's take a look well, at the Well, that's a Hebrew. message of hope. 
It is a message of hope. But let's look at the the Hebrew chapters are different, though. Let's take a look at the chiastic structure in chapters 1 and 8 through 12, the Hebrew chapters. Number 1, in chapter 1, we have the boys not being defiled by the king's meat. And then in chapter 12, you have that verse that says that those that are wise are not defiled during the tribulation. They stand and they are a light to many in the tribulation. And then chapters 8 and 11 will be your next two chiastic parallels in the Hebrew chapters. And notice here that this in chapter 8 is where the fierce king is broken without hand. That's when Adam stands at the Michael at the end of chapter 8. And then in chapter 11, the vile person comes to an end. So here in the Hebrew side of it, we see that that end time antichrist arch tyrant is taken down in Israel. And then right there in chapters 9 and 10, in the center of the Hebrew chapters, we have Messiah the Prince coming again in the Daniel chapter 9. And we have Gabriel strengthening Daniel and telling him to be strong during this time in chapter 10. So I think there's beautiful prophetic imagery just in the literary structures, like in the book of Daniel. And these all are going to all be saying the same kind of prophecies. Boy, this clicker is having trouble. The same kind of prophecies that we are seeing in the Exodus story and in Isaiah. Now, just straight parallels, things that we will see in the Exodus story that have prophetic latter-day replay fulfillment. We have the time of Jacob's trouble. In this case, we've got Israel in captivity in Egypt, and it is, notice that there they're called Israel, but in the end time they're called Jacob. So here again you see that nuance there. Then we have that Israel is crying out to God. So just wrap your head around this. This will be end time as well. There will be a captivity and a bondage that occurs where Christians as a whole and those that are believers in the restoration and even more intensive, intensely are going to be persecuted. The tares, when they get in power, will choke the wheat. The scriptures say it all over the place. God commands the oppressors to let them go. Did you know that he commands them to let them go in Isaiah? In Isaiah chapter 11, he says, Tell them in the north to let, to let the people go. And in the south, send forth my children. And I'm just paraphrasing. But the, the point is, is it replays again in the end time. The two witnesses, we talked about those a little bit in your last presentation, that uh, in our understanding, we think that it's Moses and Elijah. It's nothing that we would contend over, but there will be two witnesses there, just like there were two witnesses that went into Egypt. There was two witnesses into Egypt would be... Moses and... You're looking for me to call Yeah, me. I'm waiting for you to say there. I was just letting you go for a minute. <laughs> anyway, of course, there's two witnesses that are sent to Pharaoh, as there are two witnesses that are sent to protect Israel in the end time. All right, then, as in the time of Moses, the magicians were able to imitate the miracles. Some of. Yeah. Yeah, with the part where the, their snake ate their snakes, yeah. But my point is, is in the end time, is there places in Revelation where the image of the beast, and they will have power to do miracles. Oh, and yeah. So, well, in, in our day, most of those could be acquired through technology. Yeah, and you will have to be able to discern which ones are of God and which ones are not. You might even go back to Exodus and review how they were able to discern which miracles were of God in Exodus as a type and a shadow in the end time. And so you begin to read these chapters in the Bible with completely different eyes, knowing that they are pictures of the end from the beginning. God executed sore judgments upon the world in the time of Moses. 
And again, in the end time, we see the trumps of judgment in the book of Revelation. God will protect the people from these judgments. I love this. I love the fact that only the first three plagues were a part of Israel's experience. It's like when they when they experienced that much and proved faithful, then the Lord exempted them from the rest of the judgments. And That's a message of hope, also, isn't it? And we are taught, and I love the fact that it's it's so clear in the Book of Exodus that mm-hmm. all these judgments are being poured out on Egypt, but it was light over in Goshen, and <laughs> but, mm. but they didn't have any of that hail over in Goshen or all of these terrible things that are going on. They're being protected through it, and I think that is very much. A, p- a picture of the end time redemption of Zion. Okay, we have the plagues. We have the water turned to blood, the frogs, the locusts, the boils. We're going to go through all these plagues individually in just a minute and look at the patterns that, that, that are going on literarily in the text. And of course, each of these plagues is a direct attack on a particular Egyptian deity or in our day, we could say that each one of these things that will happen that's being poured out by the different trump, the angels sounding the trumps in the book of Revelation, each of these will be an attack on some part of our humanistic idolatry, what we put our trust in, in man. So it, it, it might be similar to, I'm just going to make this up off the top of my head. Okay, so like, let's say we had a plague in our day. Oh, and yeah, the, really? Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> and the plague was, there was an EMP blast and we lost all of our electricity. Okay? So, all of a sudden, the things that we worship, the things that, that well, were gonna, our false gods are being attacked I'm going to get by more God. personal. What yeah. about science trying to end disease creating it? Exactly. That's a plague in the sense where we... We're we're creating our own Armageddon. So <clears throat> what we're trying to say here is, yes, each of the ten plagues anciently were to attack a particular deity that they worshipped for some reason. But today we have a lot of deities that we worship, and they're called the works of our hands in Isaiah. We, we worship what our own hands have created and made. And I don't, I mean, I don't have to stretch my brain too far to think of a few plagues that would attack a few of our well, modern day deities yeah <laughs> we kind of made one up um i really didn't make it up because um, in isaiah it says that they will throw their shining images to the mat to the bats and the moles in the caves because they will be useless so um these different plagues we will we will go ahead and and go through in just a minute but i i want to pay special attention to the phrase, the stretched out arm. So in Exodus chapter 6, God says that he will save Israel with a stretched out arm. And we saw that in what verse were you reading? In Jeremiah. In Jeremiah. Mm-hmm. Jeremiah was saying it too. And, well, and All the accounts of Moses talk about many times he would use stretched out arm over the water or right. you know, the yod. And so the imagery that we're getting to with the stretched out arm is power. When Moses stretches out, even when Aaron stretched out his rod, there was consequences. It was powerful. And it wasn't God just helping somebody out on the side. It was an in-your-face interaction. It was a, if you don't do this, this is going to happen. And it's laid out before it ever occurs. It's kind of contrary to it's our power. political correct society at the moment. It, it, it's if you don't believe I'm real, let me help you out here. I, I'll give you a few clues. Okay, I will have an outstretched arm. And um, in some of our, our Latter-day scriptures, it says, and um, they will, God will, um, oh gosh, it's not reveal. It's he'll make bare. He will make bare his holy arm in power. Which and is revealing in a way, says. but it's right. a and very so direct. When you see that imagery, you think, you bring, go back to Moses. Go back to the Exodus. And in that day, there's this is Isaiah 11. 
And in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse. Now, Jesse is, of course, father. Who? David. There you go. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm hoping when I ask you and I pause that they might think for a minute and see if they can fill in the blank. Because then they get a point. And, you know, they can text me. I got a point. No. <laughs> and in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse, with Jesse being the father of David. So this is a Davidic um, a Davidic covenant, part of the Davidic line, and part of the promises to the fathers that has not been fulfilled yet, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. And this root of Jesse will also stand for the, to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles shall seek his rest, and it will be glorious. So I love this, because this is that time period when the Gentiles and Israel stop being separated. They come together. The Gentiles that hear <clears throat> and that want to be part of Israel. But once again, that one is kind of like we spoke of last time. It's a one in purpose, not necessarily... Not necessarily everybody in the same everybody place. Everybody in the or, same you know, yeah. real right. estate. And, and I love the way Jesus defines it. He says, my <clears throat> sheep hear... My voice. my voice wherever they are and it shall come to pass in that day that the lord shall set his hand again the second time so the first time is what we're talking about right here in exodus this is the first time when god fulfills the covenant sets his hand to recover his people because he is hearing their cries and he is about to do something about it because of the covenants that have been made with their fathers right and he, it shall be um, with the people that will be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam. We're basically going all around the known geographic world at the time Isaiah was written. Okay? So this is from everywhere. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and he shall assemble the outcasts of Israel. That's really cool on the one side, but on the other side, what does that mean? There, Israel is Trump. outcast, <laughs> down, okay? We're being <clears throat> oppressed by some sort of a power that is on the rise as we speak. Oh, that couldn't possibly happen. It couldn't happen. Christians couldn't be made to look like bad guys. Yeah, when did that happen? That couldn't have been part of Satan's plan to me. <laughs> <laughs> and that in that persecution, in, the, in, the, in that iron furnace... That Zion will be born? Yeah, it's, a, it's the old concept of that good will be made bad and bad will be made good and contradicting each other. In our day, you can see that all over. And I, I don't know if you want to say America will be reborn. It probably won't be called America anymore. It'll be called the kingdom. Or Zion. The kingdom is born in the fire. Okay, and he shall set up an ensign, and the outcasts of Israel will be gathered together in the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So this is the prophet, the prophetic fulfillment of the book of Exodus. All right, and then here's another one from Doctrine and Covenants, section 90. And I love this. He's talking to Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon and uh, Frederick D. Williams, the, the presidency of the church in Kirtland at the time. And he says, and through your administration, that they may receive the word. And through their administration, the word may go forth unto the ends of the earth, unto the Gentiles first. And then, behold and lo, they shall turn unto the Jews. And I get excited when I start seeing one for Israel and, and the messianic movement, movement yeah, amongst place. the Jews right now. <clears throat> it is beginning to happen. And, and you know, oh gosh, I hope I don't get in trouble for this, but this is kind of the way I see it. This is going to be Rhonda chapter one. No, anyway. <laughs> <clears throat> I thought we didn't do that. <laughs> um, when, in the Book of Mormon, it, it's, it's types and shadows, so you get to play a little bit. There's a little fudge room. Okay, so in the Book of Mormon, when Ammon... I think they call that conjecture. <laughs> I'm going to stick with extrapolation. That sounds a lot better. <laughs> anyway, one of the types in the Book of Mormon is that when Ammon and the sons of Mosiah go and they convert King Lamoni, they bring him to that place where he says, I would give all my sins to know God. And then, you know, whoop, he's out. And after two days, you know, 
no prophetic type and imagery there at <laughs> all. But you know, after our last lesson on two days and the third day, and so and arise on the appointed on, time. On, uh, the, when he, when King Lamoni quote from the from the scriptures arises at the appointed time that Ammon gave on the third day, the first thing he says is, "I have seen my redeemer." And I just, I just love that because, you know, we the Gentiles, we the Ephraimites, we get the blessing of giving it to them. But you know what? They love God. And once they have it, I'm afraid they might put a few of us Ephraimites to shame. They don't need us to interpret it for them anymore. Well, the truth they of know is, him. there's a difference between true conversion and superficial conversion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I, that's, that's the imagery that I get is that when we have this huge Lamanite and, and Jewish and ten tribe, the branches of Israel conversion in the end time, man, it's a conversion. And they know God. And then cometh the day when the arm of the Lord shall be revealed in power, in convincing the nations, the heathen nations, the house of Joseph, of the gospel of their salvation. So, you know, in, in proportion to this rise of the Pharaoh and the bondage and the persecution, guess what else rises? The heroes and the conversion and the people who love liberty and truth and righteousness and justice more than life. Think of Patrick Henry, oh, that I have but one life to give for my country. And that's what's coming. That is this end time rebirth of Israel in the fire. But clear back from Exodus chapter 6, clear back before Moses even heads off to Egypt, God makes him a promise. He says, I am the Lord. You tell this to Israel. You tell them. I am the Lord. Now you can see, I am the Lord is going to be something he repeats. And so he's going to frame seven I wills with I am the Lord and I am the Lord. I love the one concept there that there's no maybes. Yeah, I, I actually will. put that in there. No carefully God's uncertainty here. <laughs> yeah. I will bring you. From under the burden of the Egyptians. Remember, our Egyptians anciently are our end time Babylonians, which just means world power in control. Egypt was the world power in, in Isaiah's day and Moses' day. I will rid you out of their bondage. I will redeem you with a and there's oh, your there's your down. arm, that stretched out arm. And with great judgments. So when you see that holy arm being bared in Scripture, when, when you see that arm in the end time, that's power and that's judgments coming, coming on the people. <clears throat> for good or for bad. Depends if you're Egyptian or Israelite, right? <laughs> like we said at the crossing of the Red Sea. And then he says, I will take you to me for a people and I will be to you a God. Do you recognize that? I will be your people. I will be your God, yeah. That is the watch cry of the Sinai Covenant. It's what God tells Israel at Mount Sinai in a few chapters. I will be your God, and you will be my people. That's when not just a covenant has been made by a person, but a covenant has been made by a nation, by a people. That's the, if you want to call it that, the ordinance that made Israel. Israel. Set apart. Yes, is that a covenant? holy nation set apart as holy to be <clears throat> set to a, to be a holy nation is because they agreed to be in covenant with God. It, it, it's not racist; <laughs> it's covenant and right. consequences and curses and blessings as a consequence of the covenant. Based on based on justice, decision and commitment and agency. Yeah. Total agency. And then he tells them, I will bring you into the land and I will give it to you for an heritage. So here we can see that as far as the end time prophecies go, 
most of this hasn't even begun yet. Well, it, it did begin, begin with the restoration of the gospel and the prophet Joseph Smith. And it's building towards this grand finale. This, I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians, which is coming right away. Did you notice that this is where all the cups of the Passover come from? All these cups of wine that they drink at a Passover Seder or order. The very thing that Jesus was doing at the Last Supper was a Passover meal. And it was an ordinance. And he did certain things when he gave them the first cup of wine right after that cup. Then it says that he, when they didn't know where to sit, because they're, they they sit from the most important to the, the least or the oldest ideas, to youngest. they sit by rank. Right. And so that, that's when they start arguing over, you know, well, who's, who's greatest, greater? You know, you where know. are we supposed to sit down? And Jesus, Jesus does that amazing thing. And he washes their feet. And says, the greatest among you is the servant. The second cup is the cup of judgment or deliverance, depending on what side of the coin you're on. We'll talk about that one in just a minute. That one is a representation of the judgments and the plagues that were poured out at the time of the Exodus. It, in the end time, it will be a representation of the plagues that are listed in the book of Revelation. As God continues to try and get the people to recognize the difference between an idol and the true God. And then he says that I will redeem you. And that third cup, that redemption cup, will be the cup that Jesus shares with the disciples after supper and introduces the sacrament. This is the cup of my blood, which is shed for you. And this is my body, this broken bread, which I lay down for you to redeem you. And then after that, and I, this one is prophetic future. And how do you know it's prophetic future? This, I will take you to be a people and, and I will be your God. How do we know it's prophetic future? What does Jesus Number say one, about that cup? Yet. Yeah, what does he say about that <laughs> cup at the Last Supper? I won't drink this with you until until the kingdom of God is established. Yeah, until I drink it yeah. with you. We'll kind of look at those kingdom. a little bit closer in just a minute. But I wanted you to see where all of this comes from. It comes right out of these few precious prophetic promises by God, both to the children of Israel at the time of the Exodus and to us in the end time. Now in verse 8 it says that I will bring you into the land and I will give it to you for an inheritance. That is in some rabbis and to, to this day have a fifth cup and that one's the promise of going into the promised land and everything. And here's, here's kind of a picture of it. Um, this is one of our slides that we do when we do Passover firesides and stuff. We show them that the first cup that they drink, now they don't actually put four glasses on the table, it's just one cup and they refill it and often the wine is mixed down with water so that you don't have to drink so much wine but you know, some people Get, it's get into the wine part of it. Okay? I'm, so, you're talking about the, <laughs> I'm talking about the Jews. No, I know the it's, rabbis. <laughs> it's, it's traditional to have a good time at Passover. <laughs> anyway, um, the first cup was, I will bring you out. I will rid you of bondage. That's the plagues and the ten, the ten plagues that we'll look at in just a minute. The redeem you is the cup after dinner. That one was where Jesus introduced the sacrament. And then I will take you to me is that cup, that fourth cup of joy when, when we become God's people and we covenant with him as a nation again. That one, Jesus says, I will not take of this one with you until I take it with you in the kingdom of God. We'll look at that in just a second. And of course, that fifth cup is that inheritance of the promised land. And that one's that one's controversial whether or not there's four or five. Generally, they, they do four cups at the Passover. So on that second cup, the cup of the 10 plagues, they um, I love this. This is so meaningful to me. The cup represents joy because God is delivering you. These are his promises. But when they drink of this cup, for as they go through and they talk about each of the ten plagues, the blood, they take a drop of wine out of their cup 
and they place it on their plate and and they take one drop out of the cup for each of the ten plagues and that represents that their joy is diminished because others have others suffered, have suffered in, yeah. in these judgments and I think that's beautiful and they do that before they drink that that cup of, of joy at being rid of the bondage that was theirs now in the ten plagues, there's there's patterns. There's you know, of course, literary patterns going on everywhere, and it's fascinating that if you divide the first nine plagues into columns of three, then what you're going to see is that there's always a warning for the first plague, a warning for the second plague, and then bam, no warning on the third plague. It's like you know, I've given you two times to get this, and you're still not getting it. No warning, bam, and then we get another one. We get another warning, warning, then. Bam, no warning. And then notice that in each of the sets of three, you can categorize them like the the water to blood, the frogs, and the lice. This this made this was really uncomfortable. But nobody's dying. Okay. When you get to the next three plagues, there's an intensification going on. Now we're right. attacking the possessions. Now the, the cows and are they're dying. And now the the boils on on their bodies are so painful that it says that the the magicians couldn't even stand up when when Moses and Aaron came to deliver the message because they were in so much pain and trouble and and sickness. And we notice that in the last set there is death and destruction. It said anybody left outside, if you didn't believe God when he said, okay, I'm going to send hail. If you believe me, go inside. <laughs> take your servants, take your cows inside. And those that don't want to have any respect to that dumb old Hebrew God, they are going to defy that. And guess what? Everybody left outside is killed in this hailstorm. And this hailstorm strips the trees. And, and then at this point, the locusts come to eat anything that the hell hasn't destroyed. So we're talking death and destruction here and then the three days of darkness. And so you can see in these sets of three that the plagues are intensifying. You see the exact same thing in the book of Revelation. Yeah. You see the trumpet judgments. And then you see, and, and with the trumpet judgments, everything's just a third. A third of the plants die. A third of the water is poisoned. A third, it, it's part. It's like God hasn't, he hasn't stretched forth that mighty arm in power yet. yet. Yet, because of the book of Revelation, we know kind of the outcome. Right. It's just like God knew the outcome back at the burning bush. Exactly. And he told Moses, hey, they're not going to listen, but do it anyway. Here's do it the anyway, progression. This is what's going to happen, right? And so we're going to see those vials intensify the judgments. And then and then you're going to have Armageddon. It's going to, you know, grand finale in Armageddon, which is the grand finale in the Ten, in the ten Plagues was the loss of those firstborn sons that we talked about before. And, and as we are grateful... When we think of the passing over of Israel by the blood of the Lamb, sometimes we need to stop and think, wait a minute, that firstborn son saved our firstborn sons. We get delivered, but he didn't. Well, he did, but yeah, it was different. <laughs> he didn't get delivered. He got recovered. Yeah. And yeah. Even, even then, I mean, there's so many nuances all throughout the chapters in Exodus. But take a note of the fact that Moses and Aaron are instructed to ask Pharaoh that they are able to go for three days into the wilderness. And, and why three days? Because that is the interval between death and new life and resurrection, symbolically even in the wilderness journey. Different ways you can sort these plagues and put them together. You can There's a chiastic way you can do it by numbering up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Coming back down, you find literary parallels, like in 5 and 6, they both involve the cattle. And in 4 and 7, they both say that Goshen, specifically they mention that Goshen was exempted from these plagues. 
And then in three and eight, you have in each of these plagues, you have in the first case, you have the magician saying, um, we've been struck by lice and we have to shave every third day to be clean and to be able to worship our gods. And we got lice and we can't even perform our priestly duties here. And so they're, they go and they tell Pharaoh, this is nothing but the finger of God. And I mean, here again, more links, finger of God on the wall in Daniel when Babylon's going to fall. Egypt's about ready to fall here. And then we've got um, after the eighth plague, after the locusts, we have the, the servants of Pharaoh saying, let these people go. But, you know, of course, Pharaoh hardens his heart. And the Lord has done this so that his power can not only be displayed in Egypt, but it can be displayed in the world. Even when they go in to conquer Jericho, you remember Rahab is going to say to Joshua, I heard about that God down in Egypt. <laughs> you know, this is when, then when he establishes his power and authority. And this is what will happen in the end time as well as he reclaims the planet back from Satan. Other nuances in, in the plagues of Egypt. Remember at what time that scriptures are careful to give us a specific time that God passed over the firstborn. You know what it is. The midnight hour. Of course. It's the midnight hour. And you know, in the scriptures there's never a detail that Not isn't important. Be. You know, it's important. Christ. Why do you need to know that? You need to know that because Passover seders have to end before midnight. That's what the rabbis say. You, you don't want to, you know, make people hate this day. You want you want to get your long windedness done. <laughs> I'm like calling the kettle black here. <laughs> okay, so you want to get done before midnight. And so they're going to wrap this up. They're going to wrap up the Last Supper in the New Testament before midnight, and then they're going to sing a hymn, and then they're going to head out for a walk over across to the Mount of Olives, across the brook, Kidron, and they are, they're going, Jesus is going to give them those beautiful discourses on the Comforter in John chapters 14, 15, and 16. And then they'll cross the river and he'll, they'll be in the garden for John chapter 17 for the intercessory prayer. But here in the garden, According to Luke, Jesus says, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. These are the cups that we've been talking about, that we just did at the Passover. This is that cup that he has to drink. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat were as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And this is the blood of the Lamb. And this is the only way to be saved. DNC 19, For behold, I, God, have suffered these things for all, that they might not suffer if they would repent. And if they would not repent, they must suffer even as I, which suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain and to bleed at every pore and to suffer both body and spirit during the week of Passover. The bread that they eat is called the bread of affliction. It's the furnace that burns out the dross and makes gold and silver celestial people. And I would that I might not drink the bitter cup and shrink. And during this Passover meal, they have bitter herbs that also represent this bondage, this suffering before Zion is reborn. Nevertheless, glory be to the Father. And I partook and finished my preparations unto the children of men. Now, all of this is memorialized today in what would have been in Jesus' time and in the time of the Exodus, the third cup. The third cup after supper, where he says the promise, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, with power. And the sacrament was introduced. We can see at this point in the service, they would traditionally have read or told 
the chapters that we're reading right now. The Passover story. Nearly 3,500 years have they been keeping this ordinance, this rehearsal that they were commanded to do throughout their generations forever. This is the bread of affliction which our ancestors in the ate in the land of Egypt. Let all those who are hungry enter and eat thereof, and all who are in distress come and join us as we celebrate it here. But next year, we hope to celebrate it in the land of Israel. This year, we are servants here, but next year, we hope to be free in Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, both in the old world and in the new. And for us, that will be when God establishes his kingdom and Michael stands at Adam and Ahmed, which are all things that Daniel's numbers point to. So at this point, as they're going through this Last Supper, they would have reviewed the story of the first Passover in Egypt. And then at the very end, as they're concluding, they would have raised that fourth cup because this is like the toast at the end. And this is the, the halal, the cup of praise and joy. And by the time they've had that much wine, they're probably really joyful. <laughs> hey, yeah. <laughs> And this is at this point in Luke 22 where Jesus says, And when the hour was come, he sat down with the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Whew. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Matthew records it this way, I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, we have pictures of this in, in Scripture. This is in Doctrine and Covenants. I think this is 27. Behold, this is wisdom in me. Wherefore, wherefore marvel not the hour cometh that I will drink of the fruit of the vine with you on the earth. Now, he's saying this to Joseph Smith and to the brethren there. And he says, and Guess who's going to be there? Moroni! And Elias. There's been many Eliases in scriptures. These are pictures of Noah. He's also called Elias in the scriptures. And John, the son of Zacharias, John the Baptist. Would you like to meet John? And Elijah is going to be there. And it actually goes on. And there's tons and there's tons and there's tons. And this is the sacrament meeting that you do not want to miss. At Adam and Diamond. Now there are so many prophetic things embedded in what's happening historically in the story of the Exodus and that we absolutely don't have time to go through them. We do have videos on our website as we're producing them on all the Feasts of the Lord. So far we've got the Fall Feasts about His Second Coming up there that you can stream those for free and then also probably in the next couple of months we'll be having the Passover and first fruits videos up there and recorded. By the end of the year, we'll finish it up and have Shavuot done. But it's important to realize that first fruits is, is a part of this Passover celebration. It's the day after the Sabbath. So there's the Passover, and then the very next Sabbath, the morning after that, is called the day of first fruits. And it is at the time of Christ a resurrection. This is when he presents the first fruits of the harvest to the Father in the barley harvest, and it is the beginning of the first resurrection. We see these things playing out prophetically in our day, in the end time since the restoration of the prophet Joseph Smith. During the Passover, part of the deal is that at the some point after supper, they tell all the little kids, go open the door and see if Elijah's here. You right. know, because, you know, we've all been looking for Elijah since Malachi recorded that, behold, the great, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord will come Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. And so they, the Jews have been looking for the coming of Elijah for many, many centuries. And every time the kids run to the door and they say, Elijah, Elijah, are you here? And then they come back over to the table, nope. 
Not, not today. This, yeah. They have a place for him set right at the table and, right. and everything. But, you know, it just so happens that it was during Passover on First Fruits in 1836 that Elijah came. He came with Moses, just like Malachi said. We always quote that verse 5 about Elijah. Very, We always forget to quote the one right before it where it says, Remember ye the law of Moses? You know, this is like quoted in in by in Sir Nephi by Jesus. It was quoted to Joseph Smith by Moroni. Right. It's quoted all over the place, but we only remember verse 5 because that DNC section 2 picks it up at verse 5 and doesn't quote verse 4 like all the other ones do. But the point we want to make is that Elijah and Moses were translated for an end time mission. And that mission began in 1836 when they came at the Kirtland Temple. And you find this recorded in DNC section 110. Elijah the prophet, who was taken up to heaven without tasting death, stood before us and said, Behold, the time has fully come, spoken of by the mouth of Malachi, testifying that he, Elijah, should be sent. And he came right when places were being set all over the world for him to return. Well, in, this is cool in stuff. conceptually, yeah, but in reality, well, it was first fruits. First fruits, yeah. Yes. I was going to say he came on the on. He the, didn't come during the Passover Seder itself. He actually came, he came on resurrection. On resurrection, day. and he came on first yeah, fruits. He came on resurrection, symbolically, day, which is really new beginnings. And they said at that time that ye may know that the great and dreadful day of the Lord is near, even at the doors. All right, so we could go. Oh, over where we're running out of time here, so I can't go over it in detail. Maybe you guys can like screenshot your, your slide here. But what we've done is we've gone and we've showed you every detail that was commanded about the Passover lamb in Exodus chapter 12 and how it was a picture of Christ. Do you have a favorite one you want to talk about? I hadn't given that previous thought, but... Um. I could talk for a minute about the bones not being well, broken. Well, you want to know my favorite, I guess. Because that happened at the cross, favorite. you know. It's when... not a favorite. My fo focus is right there on the first one, that the selection of the lamb and the triumphal entry. I kind of figured you'd go would there. Be, I mean, that would be in our Bethlehem star, a Hebrew How about you take side. the next three slides? Well, I don't know whether there I There you go. But three, in the essence, by eight. Well, How do you figure out when Jesus was born? From his death. Well, in essence, when you go to Third Nephi and you realize that the 33rd year had passed away, and we are in the 34th year, and most people think the 34th year had passed away. That's not the way biblical time or okay, Hebrew so time is taken. It pause, is. Pause for a second. I want to make one thing super clear to everybody that's listening here. Okay, I think they we can figure out that he's 33 years old, but the part they don't realize is it's he's 33 years old when he dies. Right. right. You have to take a backwards figure, his birth date, from when he died. Exactly. And I get where you're trying to go with that. But in essence, what I want to clarify is understand that 34th year, we're in it. We're not past it. So it's the, really the first month of the 34th year, which means 33 first month fourth day so it's really only four days so it's Jesus like is 30, it's like we would consider january 4th right <laughs> you know right it's only it's, four days into the new year uh, yeah jesus is 33 years and, and four, four days, days old, old when he dies yeah and if he dies on passover being the 14th four days back okay so is the 10th so he was born according to the nissan book of mormon 10. nissan 10 which is the first month, ten, which is Exodus, the selection of the Lamb. There it is on the tenth day, Exodus twelve three. Speaking of the congregation of Israel, saying, "The tenth day of the month, they shall take unto them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for every house." And so, why so, is it important that on this day, Nisan ten, at the time of the selection of the Lamb, that Jesus is born? Well, to fulfill all Scripture, for one. I mean, in essence, he, the, God doesn't do anything by accident. So when he appointed the 10th day as the selection of the lamb, he was setting a pattern up that that would be his birth 
physically, his pronouncement as the Messiah on the triumphal At the triumphal entry, entry when he entered in Jerusalem right. on Nisan 10, so, 10 days before pa- four days before Passover. Yeah, Nisan four 10. days before Passover being the 10th day. So in essence, that is the prophetic type he gave us in Exodus. But I think one of the coolest little details that you get out of this is that you realize if Jesus was born, when if triumphal entry was his birthday, being born on Nisan 10, then 33 years before his triumphal entry, it would have been a day when they were selecting another Passover lamb. And the high priest would have gone to the fields of Bethlehem yeah, it's to find this lamb. And because it had to be a firstborn lamb, the shepherds had to witness it. Only the shepherds would know which yeah. lambs were firstborn. Very beautifully laid out in Bethlehem's star, a Hebrew wedding in the sky. Yes, your video. And yeah. that one's available. You can watch really, it on our website as well. You, know, you, you can really right look at that real clear. It is the day that the lamb who represents Israel is chosen from the temple flocks in Bethlehem. And the shepherds are required to witness that lamb is firstborn. Hence why there had to be shepherds witnessing the birth of Christ. Yeah, he, God leaves no types. I know, he's just No perfect. stone unturned so, in those So things. perfect, so perfect. So during this Passover Seder, this this order, this 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 family fireside that they hold every year with a feast, they um, have a tradition that that on the fourth day after they've had this this lamb that they chose on the tenth for four days. Then right before they bring the lamb up to Temple Mount to be slaughtered, the father of the family, the head, they call him the bail boss of the family, he will examine the lamb one more time for any blemish or defect. So the person in charge. The person in charge. Examines the lamb. Examines the lamb. And then makes this crazy statement. Then he washes his hands. Yeah. I find no fault in him. It's beautiful. And then he's ready to be sacrificed. And I hope that you made all of those connections in Matthew 27, when Pilate, when he saw that he could prevail nothing, to rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude and saying, as said, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. And then in John, I find in him no fault. Yes. Okay, and we talked about the fact that the, the lamb's legs, the lamb couldn't have broken bones, right? right? So, of course, we know from John 19 that when they came to Jesus to break his legs because they were trying to hurry up to get was, him buried before, was already passed. before the first day of unleavened bread. Meaning he voluntarily gave up the ghost. That he was dead already and they break not his legs. And we could tell I stories know. about... I love the parallels between Christ on the cross saying it is finished and then in the end times in Revelation and in DNC 88 where it says it is finished. It is finished. I'm Twice. Done. It it's is a done. double yeah. it's a double reinforcement that this time it's doubly finished. Yeah. Behold the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, is how the book of Revelation opens. Yeah, in chapter beautiful. one. All right, an animal's blood was symbolic. It only covered their sins each year and kept judgment from falling on them. The intoning blood of Jesus Christ would truly take away not just the transgression of one man, as we saw pictured at the Akita, the sacrifice of Isaac, when the ram was caught in the thicket, or the sin of an entire household, like we see at Passover, when the blood of the lamb passed over an entire family. Or even the sins of an entire nation, like we see pictured in the Day of Atonement and the services that they go through on that Day of Atonement that we have up on our website. But he would take away the sins of the world. In John, you take this one. Um, I'm not sure where you wanted to go with that. Three o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, okay. Now I know where you're going. Okay, so 
in three o'clock in the afternoon, you know, that that's when he comes off the cross. But at that moment in time, you got to realize in the temple what's happening. They finish the daily sacrifice. And just at the time, Christ on the cross. Well, let me reverse this. Well, first he at says, the same I, time, I thirst, right? Yeah, he says, I thirst. Right there. Okay, then let me back up. The priest in the temple finishes the sacrifice at three. And the first words he speaks traditionally out of his mouth every year is, I thirst. And they he's bring been working drink. hard all day. Yeah, they slaughtered day. thousands of Passover lambs. And then he raises, after he gets his drink and can clear his throat, clear his throat he gets to the end and he raises his hands as if on the cross. And he says, it is finished. So as an exact type of what's happening in the temple, Christ is fulfilling in in Calvary. So we have so many types and shadows going on. We have the types and shadows of what's happening historically in Egypt. We have the types and shadows of what happens traditionally every year in this ordinance that they perform, this, this Passover meal, this Seder service. And then we have the types and shadow of the angels and the trumpets and revelations, how it's all going to play out in the end time. And so there is so much depth here and so much, many parallels that, that you need to be able to connect and make. In the passing over of the first blood, this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. It wasn't random. Every detail that was occurring, everything that was happening, was planned from the foundation of the world, as is the end time. Yes, yeah, so it's beautiful too. I, I'm, we're going to see another one. God knew that the, the day and the hour, he even knew the songs that would be sung at his son's funeral in the, in the New Testament where it says, and they sang a hymn. We know what hymn that was. That was the Hallel, Psalm 113 to 118, that they always sing at the end of a Passover service. And then he went to Gethsemane. Passing over the firstborn. Pharaoh read in the end of his last presentation, Jeremiah 23, where it says, Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north countries and from all countries whither I have driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. But this time we'll pick it up, and we'll pick up Ephraim's role in all of this in Hello. Jeremiah 31. For there shall be a day that the watchmen upon Mount Ephraim shall cry, Arise ye, let us go up to Zion unto the Lord our God. And they will come with weeping, and with supplications will I lead them, and I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel. And Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. As we end this presentation, I just wanted to end with this thought. And this is what the difference between being set apart and not being set apart is. And I, this was a quote from a dear friend. You know what the reward for doing responsibility well is? More responsibility. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, in concept, that sounds awful if you don't want to be responsible. And that's true. And that's why you won't get it if you don't want it. But if you want it, take it. Take responsibility for yourself, for your family, for those around you, and bless. Thank you. And have a great time till the next time, right? Yep, as we uh, head out into the wilderness <laughs> in the book of Exodus and in the future. 
God bless. See you next time.